We have a liftoff and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here. It's going to be very So what if I told you that the next generation faces a grave danger that doesn't relate to climate change, healthcare, technology, or likely whatever else is on your mind? The issue is known as financial illiteracy. And according to a survey conducted by the National Financial Educators Council, nearly two thirds of Americans cannot pass a basic financial literacy test. But let me backtrack a little bit and share my own personal story. So growing up, like most kids, I tried hundreds of things to find a hobby. You know, I sang, I danced, I learned how to paint, I did science projects, I learned how to code. And while these were all interesting things, I ultimately fast, uh, possessed a fascination for the ideas of entrepreneurship and the idea of attempting to build generational wealth. And when I use the term fascinated, I really, really mean so. I dropshipped everyday consumer products. I traded option contracts in the stock market. I started a clothing brand. I started a digital marketing agency. And while these were all profitable ventures, they were not producing at the level I aspired to, largely due to the inadequate capital I possessed to actually scale these various ideas. And as a result, I began to search for ways in which I can make a great deal of money in a very, very quick and efficient manner. And as a result, I watched hundreds of videos like this one. However, one idea resonated extremely strongly with me, and this was a concept known as sports betting. Now, not to sound cliche, but growing up playing soccer my entire life, I saw this as an opportunity in which I could kill two birds with one stone. Watching sports, something that I love to do, and making money off of it. Little did I know that this would be one of the biggest mistakes I could have made in my short life thus far. I became so addicted to the concept of sports betting that when I realized I could not watch a single athletic event without wagering money on it, I knew that it was truly an issue. The quote you see on the screen was the motto that I live by. 99% of gamblers quit before they hit big. And believe me when I say I never hit big. And I kept going onwards for months and months, and I realized the damage it was doing to me both financially and mentally. And I knew that I had to stop. So after four to five months and getting a lot of support from my friends, my family, and my sister, I was able to overcome this addiction. But I realized that there were still so many kids my age, older and younger, that were not just struggling with the issue of sports betting, but with the issue of making poor financial decisions as a whole. And as a result, to try to uncover and find out why they were making these poor financial decisions, I began to read about financial literacy. And I came across one of my favorite books, if not my favorite, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki and Sharon Ledger. So within the book, so many quotes have really stuck with me. However, one quote has had a much larger impact on me, and that was the fact that illiteracy both in words and numbers is the foundation of financial struggle. And through this quote, he was able to put into perspective the power of financial education and how many individuals across the world and across the United States actually lack this financial education. And as a result, taking the initiative myself, I founded an organization called Brevard Finance for Youth, where I currently visit schools teaching children about personal finances and interview professionals across a broad range of industries to showcase to children how many different career options that are potentially lie for them in the future ahead. And I was able to see one clear thing. It was the fact that these kids lacked knowledge about basic financial skills. You know, these kids had the knowledge on how to solve complex differential equations in calculus, the ins and outs of chemistry, how to code and design a new prototype that could aid in disease detection. But at the same time, these same individuals did not have the knowledge on how to open a bank account, the difference between credit and debit, and so much more. And I realized how truly of an issue this truly is. Financial literacy is a topic that is of paramount importance to each and every one of us, regardless of our socioeconomic status, our background, our race, ethnicity, profession, and etc. It's something that ultimately impacts all of us, because ultimately it's money that makes the world go round. It allows us to pursue our dreams and passions, allows us to pursue our basic needs. Yet despite its critical importance in our lives, it's one area where a lot of us tend to fall short in. And this issue becomes even more prevalent in a world that is becoming extremely technologically oriented. Say, for example, the rise of fintech. Fintech encompasses a broad range of assets, including things such as cryptocurrencies, NFTs, AI related to financial developments, and so much more. And oftentimes, while I'm a firm advocate for the uh, industry of fintech, it oftentimes causes the common investor to lose a large percentage of their initial investment simply due to the fact that they do not know how to manage their risks and navigate themselves properly throughout the industry. Going back to the discussion of sports betting, Sports betting is now legalized in 33 states, including Washington, D.C., and is rapidly being legalized in the remaining states. Now, a lot of topics do not confuse me, but this one does a great deal. I want you guys to remember the number 33. 33 states have legalized uh, sports betting, versus roughly 20 states that have mandated financial literacy with only half of these states in actually enacting it. 33 versus 20. And you know, I get it. From an economic sense, the gambling industry brings in millions of dollars in the form of tax revenues that allows our government to fund so many different programs. However, the ultimate goal of our government is to protect the interests of our people. 
68 million Americans are carrying some form of credit card debt. 69% of individuals have less than $1,000 in their savings account. And according to Bankrate's annual report, 68% of individuals believe that if they were laid off from their job for one month, they could not cover their living expenses. Now, upon hearing these statistics, you may think it's common sense that some action is being taken to address it. However, you'd be wrong. In fact, financial literacy is not a topic that has a lot of significance re regarding the action that's being taken. I want to ask you guys, how many of you guys have taken a financial literacy course anywhere from kindergarten to 12th grade? Any of you guys? Now I want to ask you guys, how many of you guys have taken a class anywhere from kindergarten to 12th grade that has no application to what you're doing today or that you simply were not interested in? Quite a big disparity, right? Well, that's the thing. Financial literacy is a topic that is of paramount importance, but oftentimes goes unnoticed. And I'm honored today to be giving you guys your first financial literacy course in, say, a minute and a half period. So hi, everyone. My name is Rochelle, and today I'm going to be teaching you guys about budgeting and debt management. So a budget refers to a plan of how much you will spend and allocate your money each and every month. And there's one main strategy for uh, beginners, the 50-30-20 rule. 50% of your money goes towards needs, 30% of your money goes towards wants, and 20% of your money goes towards savings and debt management. Now, what is debt? Well, debt refers to money that is owed from the borrower to the lender and typically involves paying off a money with some form of interest associated with it. And there's two main strategies to pay off the debt. There's the debt avalanche method and the debt snowball method. The debt avalanche method involves paying off the loan with the highest interest rate first, while the debt snowball method involves paying off the loan with the smallest valuation before quickly working your way up to the loan with the highest valuation. And that is an example of a terrible financial literacy course. As I'm guessing, a lot of you guys fell asleep, a lot of you guys took nothing away, or the, dic the definitions went completely right over your head. And that's the thing. Financial literacy is not just about education, but it's about instilling behaviors within the minds of these children. It's one thing to know that you should save money, invest in a diversified portfolio, avoid high interest debt, but it's another thing entirely to do these things consistently over time. And this is where financial literacy education comes into the form of interactive and engaging activities. I'm going to give you guys one example of how these activities that are more interactive and engaging changed my whole perception on a subject and created and instilled behaviors within me. So I'm currently a junior in high school, I'm in 11th grade, and I can confidently say, ever since kindergarten, I've always liked math a lot more than language arts. And this was simply due to the fact that with math, you could follow a set set of procedures, use certain laws and certain rules, and arrive at a set conclusion. Versus language arts is something that is a lot more abstract and requ uh, requires a lot more critical thinking to arrive at a conclusion that other people simply may not arrive at. And as a result, I've always preferred math over language arts. However, I've had one teacher for the longest time, and the way that she taught me completely changed my perception on the subject and changed the way that I now read text and answer questions. So just for some context, the teacher's name is Ms. Reese, and I've had her in first grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, and 11th grade. And I've gone to two different schools, by the way, so I've had her for a very, very long time. And I used to think of something like language arts as something that, you know, once you read a text, you answer questions, you write an essay. It's the same thing over and over again. However, she taught me that language arts is something that evolves. You know, we learn about new strategies and new, new tools. And now, through her teaching style, I have behavior stuck in my head. So now when I read a piece of text, I look for certain words. When I answer multiple choice questions, I look for certain strategies that I can utilize to better assist in helping me answer these questions. And that same thing carries over to financial literacy, creating interactive and engaging activities for these children so that they carry over these skills as a behavior rather than just a dictionary definition stuck in their head. But financial literacy goes beyond just education behaviors. It also applies to the environment. We need to do a better job of creating an environment that promotes financial transparency, you know, preventing predatory lending, increasing transparency in investing practices, and ultimately through a culmination of all these factors, education, behaviors, and a better environment will be able to ensure the financial security for the future generation as well as the current generation. So now what I want to talk to you guys a little bit about is the aspects of psychology. You know, you think of psychology and you probably don't even think of financial literacy. You may be wondering how, those, how are those two topics even remotely connected. However, I'm here to tell you that those two topics are extremely connected. So over the last three or four years, after engaging in the poor financial decision making myself, I wanted to ask myself, why did I continue to do so, even when I was aware of the horrific consequences that came about? And ultimately, as a result of this, I've conducted a three-year-long multidisciplinary study, which I'm still currently conducting, involving financial decision making. In specifics, the title of the paper and the title of my presentation for my research is The Impact of Celebrity Endorsements on the Artificial Growth of Cryptocurrencies Using a Multi-Level Land Class Analysis and a Software-Based Approach. So a whole bunch of fancy words. But in a brief synopsis, what I did was say Kim Kardashian's posting a celebrity endorsement on Instagram. 
What are the underlying psychological factors that actually cause us to go and purchase these cryptocurrencies simply based on the fact of seeing that endorsement? And through this research, I was able to find so many different factors that influence our financial decision making. And two key factors that I'm going to share with you guys are the aspects of greed and emotions. So beginning with greed, you know, in a society that is becoming extremely materialistic, it's just common human nature to want the newest and the nicest thing. You know, the newest iPhone that comes out, the newest pair of Jordans, the newest purse, the newest video game system. We want the newest things. And oftentimes that causes us to go against our financial beliefs and our financial situation, causing us to enter a period of economic hardship. What I really want to talk to you guys about, though, is the aspect of emotions. Emotions, in my perception, are the biggest thing that are hindering individuals' financial stability and financial security. As when we factor in emotions too heavily, we tend to get clouded in our judgments and tend to make poor decisions financially. So one example that I want to share with you guys that I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to is in the aspects of investing. So I began investing at the age of 13, and being the fact that I was 13, I did not have $100,000 sitting in my bank account. Take away three zeros, and that's what I had, $100. And I made the money through pressure washing houses. And when I put the money in the stock market, you know, I wanted to grow it quite rapidly. I wanted to grow it a large amount. And I, was set up to, I said to myself, I'm going to buy Apple, I'm going to buy Berkshire Hathaway, I'm going to buy Microsoft, I'm going to buy all these stocks. I opened up the stock, I opened up the app that I utilized to trade stocks, and I see one share of Berkshire Hathaway. $434, and I didn't want to tell myself that I own 0.25% of one share of Berkshire Hathaway. So what do I do? I get into penny stocks, and I would highly recommend not investing in penny stocks, but for the sake of it, that's what I did. And this is the penny stock that I got into. The name is Marathon Patent Digital. It was a company that specialized in cryptocurrency mining, and I got in at $0.4, so relatively cheap, and I bought 150 shares. And you know, I knew and I had a good feeling that the stock would grow a significant amount. And two weeks later, my intuition proved right. The stock grew to nearly $1.80 within two weeks, which was quite extensive. You know, I saw, I saw that I received 4x my initial investment and I sold. I was the happiest 13-year-old in the world. You know, and I was like, there's no way the stock's going to keep going up. You'd be wrong. Two months later, the stock keeps going up. Six months later, the stock keeps going up. A year and a half later, the stock keeps going up. And when I say up, I'm not talking about a linear line. I'm talking about an exponential growth. The stock grew more than 9,800% in a span of a year and a half. And my 13-year-old self almost started crying. You know, I just missed out on tens of thousands of dollars simply because I sold too early. And what did this do? So now whenever I made an investment decision and I was up a significant amount in a stock, I held on to it with the fear that what if the stock goes up? And that was the thing. I was factoring in my emotions too heavily in the investments I made, and that's the power and the possibility of this financial literacy education in, emo in eliminating the sense of emotions quite extensively in the sense of your personal finance decisions. You know, now that I mentioned possibilities to you guys, I want to talk a little bit about the possibilities of financial literacy education. You know, me personally, even though I'm so heavily engrossed in the subject, when I hear the word possibility, I don't even think of personal finances. You know, I think of artificial intelligence. I think of healthcare. I think of agriculture. So many different industries that have so many extensive different numbers of possibilities that will benefit society in a great extent. However, I'm here to tell you that financial literacy has so many possibilities that oftentimes go unnoticed. You know, the fact that we as individuals can save and better invest our money and grow it over time allows the possibility of, who knows, maybe opening your dream business, something that many individuals dream of doing. You know, being the first in your family to potentially pursue a higher education. Through all of these opportunities is, as a result, could come about through the increase in financial literacy education. However, the biggest possibility that I want to touch on with you guys is the aspects of the wealth inequality. In the short time of two years that I've been talking to students about personal finances, I've talked to students who attend public schools, private schools, choice schools, charter schools, and all different types of schools. And I can confidently say the students in the more privileged neighborhoods and attend these maybe these private institutions typically have a better understanding of their personal finances simply due to the fact that they may be in a more environment that is more financially transparent and actually teaches their children these financial skills versus children who live in more marginalized communities and say attend these Title I schools typically have a lack of understanding regarding, regarding their personal finances simply due to the fact that maybe their parents do not teach them, to teach them these skills. And as a result, what this does is it increases the wealth inequality. However, through the possible creation of a financial literacy curriculum universally across the entire uh, nation, we can potentially help minimize this wealth gap in the near future. And I know you guys may be thinking to yourself, what 13-year-old, what 14-year-old, what 15-year-old wants to be learning about their personal finances, you know? Why wouldn't they just fall asleep in class? But I can confidently say once again 
that kids are actually interested about the subject. In the short time of two years that I've been talking to students about their personal finances, some say for the first time that upon receiving their paycheck from working, they begin investing it into mutual funds like SPY. Some say for the first time that upon learning about financial literacy that they found something that they're so passionate about that they want to pursue in their higher education. And this makes me as an individual feel great that they're finding a cause that they're passionate about in eliminating a problem that is so important in the future of our society. So thank you for joining me in this conversation and I hope to your commitment in promoting financial literacy in your schools, your homes, and your communities. Thank you so much.